Range monitoring methods have been used by farmers and ranchers for decades. The methods used can vary widely, but in general they all accomplish the same thing. They determine the change in the rangeland over a period of time. Three common and simple methods are photo point, cover pole, and line point intercept. Each method differs in the supplies needed and the amount of time needed to complete, but all of them can be used for both short and long periods of monitoring. Photo points are an easy way to visually see the differences in rangeland over time. Rod Voss uses this method on his ranch and shares these tips. Got a five foot piece of PVC and I can set that over my center stake here and this gives me a, a system height that I'm taking my picture from. Every single time I'm going to come back to this spot here and I'm going to lay out my hundred foot tape and I'm going to take a picture down that line. Then, caught myself here, then I can turn around and do the same thing, put, lay out my 100 foot line here and do the same thing, and likewise on the third one. So, so that way I've got pictures of all three uh, points, all three transects. The cover pole or Robel pole method is a little more difficult and time consuming than taking photo points, but illustrates the diversity in the vegetation structure. For this method, you are looking for the height at which the forage is dense enough that you can no longer see through it. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist Chuck Pyle demonstrates making a cover or modified robel pole and using this method. And you take point, put this point in the ground. It's usually, usually you can get by with a you know a yardstick about that high, of 48 inches or um, yeah, that would usually work. And usually can, you can get through that buck brush. The only time it probably wouldn't work is in a really dense stand of warm seasons, especially when you get in the eastern part of South Dakota and that tall grass prairie stuff. Probably lose it. You might want something a little bit taller. Um, but in, then you end up doing is you're actually four yards, supposed to be four meters, but four yards or 12 feet away from the stick. We use poly wire. You're going to use plastic baling twine. It's trying to use all the tools that you guys should be able to find or your operators that you're working with have. And you actually you read it in actually four cardinal directions. So you go east, west, north, and south at each station, and then you take that average. So I go back, and what this, this stake here is doing is actually giving your eye the same elevation to shoot off of every time, so it's constant. We go back here, and you'll, you'll really find it interesting that it, how much it actually does change. You look at it, well, I know it'll, it's not that big a deal. It ain't going to change that much. But even for I'm looking at it, four different four different uh, directions, it really changes that vi that uh, vegetation, uh, visual obstruction reading really changes. But if we're looking across there and I'm looking for the number that disappears, and I'm going to say, let's say three. So we write down three in our station and we go around and we do uh, those four cardinal directions and record them and we take that average and you take that back and compare it across your ranch. The line point intercept method of range monitoring is more time intensive than the previous, but is not difficult to complete. This method is important in determining cover, bare ground, and species composition. This method is considered one of the most accurate monitoring methods by scientists. Stan Bowles, NRCS range specialist, demonstrates using this method. Basically, I usually hold the flag kind of in the middle, just between my uh, finger and thumb, and then um, lower this the lower the pin down to about the height of the vegetation here and then just uh, let go just a little bit and let it slide down through your hand and that they say is is the best way and the most unbiased way to to drop the flag to, to get your data so after you do that um, I usually hold it with one of my hands and then I'll just see what what you're recording is the plants that are touching the flag so here this one here is touching then uh, Ideally, you'll want to record the species. So that's western wheatgrass. So on your on your data sheet, you'd record western wheatgrass. The next one that's touching here is western wheatgrass again. So you only have to record that species the first time you hit it, if it's touching more than once. So you can just kind of skip that one. There's western again. You can skip that. And then right kind of on top of the soil surface, I've got herbaceous litter. So I can just record that as litter. It's not rooted in. It's just laying there. That's litter. And then right at the soil surface I just have uh, bare ground. 
So then that's, so what you're recording is canopy, uh, what's sitting on top of the soil surface, and then what's right at the soil surface. That's what you're recording. For the soil surface, the kind of the options for what you can record is basically none or, or bare ground, um, moss or lichens, uh, rock fragments, or if you do happen to hit the base of a plant right at the soil surface, then that would be a basal hit of a plant. And that's pretty critical because uh, basal cover can change, and, and if you do see changes with it, that's going to tell you quite a bit. So the only other thing about in rhizominous plant communities, it's, it's kind of almost a little bit on the rare side to actually have basal hits because there's just single individual stems standing up all in there. So if, if this is the, the western wheatgrass and you're real close to it, you wouldn't call it a basal hit. But if you're actually touching it or actually on top of it, then it'd be a basal hit. Now bunch grasses, if you have a bunch of blue grama in here, those will be pretty easy to get a basal hit because anywhere the flag lands inside that blue grama, that's a basal hit. So any questions?